welcome everyone. I thought of creating a technical section in my blog where I would record my learnings of application of Unix on telecom platform. Well, I couldn't just quite uh, make it to that day still. However, I managed to create a topic which I'm recording today, which relates to telecom. And in the end, I'll try and see if I can somehow hook Unix onto this topic. I still have not quite mastered the mechanism of recording videos on subjects and I'm thus not able to link my PowerPoint presentation to this video. So I will resort to the old mechanism of referring to the slide numbers which I will attach below the video in my blog for reference and uh, speak on the slides in a progressive manner. I sincerely hope that this new adventure of mine will be interesting for you and uh, I would find audience for future recordings as well. Well, without wasting more than one and a half minutes on this, I get on to the subject. The subject is when we are conducting billing in any circumstance, like for example, we are a telecom operator and we require to generate a lot of bills for all our postpaid customers every month. Now, obviously we want all our bills to be accurate, but as is the nature of any computing practice or any operation, there is bound to be some errors. Now the question is, how can we minimize the amount of errors in uh, exercise like billing. Now, uh, in this this brings about a different dimension also, like what is the amount of investment I need to make uh, so that I create an infrastructure for people to get their bills rectified. How large should that department be? So the, that department will be smaller if my bills are more accurate. The department needs to be larger if my bills are less accurate. Now, in, in, in some total, there has to be a cost-benefit analysis as to what is the optimum amount of accuracy which I need to look at so that I have the best profitability for my, for my organization. Now, so we, we, we talk about billing and billing is a subject which applies to almost any atmosphere, be it a credit card company or any, any commodity vendor who is giving some kind of a postpaid service. We talk in terms of a telco. And consider a telco where we are generating around 3 million bills in a month. Now, a telecom operator's bill typically takes about 15 minutes to verify at an average, considering that there will be some customers who make very few usage and thus uh, there will be not too many products with these customers and very few number of calls during the month or data usage and there will also be customers who have large number of products more than one number of connections and uh, huge volume of calls of all types international and things like that but we, we, we it can be very safe to assume that it will take around 15 minutes on average to verify a bill across all different kind of samples now practically considering a team of two people uh, to work on two days I feel it would be prudent to estimate that we can verify about 160 bills at the very maximum. Now the question is, to generate 3 million bills, is it prudent to just verify 160 bills? Is this sufficient? What is the level of confidence the conf company can have with such an exercise? Let's see. Moving to slide 3. Now the theory says that if I have a huge population and from that huge population, if I consider a very minuscule number of items as my sample, the average probability is independent of the sample size. What it means is that, like, typical to our case, like if we consider a 3 million population and we pick out some 200 or 300 bills out of that, that the number of errors I find in this sample 
will be more or less the same if I consider a bigger sample. The, 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 the percentage of errors in a sample of 200 to 300 builds will be more or less be the same uh, percentage in a sample of 2000 to 3000 builds. This is what the theory says. However, the extent to which my estimation of my estimation would be incorrect would reduce if the sample size is increased. So I can speak more accurately to my management if in case I do a larger, if I consider a larger sample. So in effect, it is definitely that a larger sample is more desirable. However, the question still remains, is it absolutely mandatory? If it is considered, what will be the cost of increasing the sample size? Let's see. In slide 4, I present the formula which proves what I was stating in the previous slide. Now, if you see the formula for av estimate of average, it is a quantity which is not dependent on the number of samples. So, the probability of success as measured in any size of the sample will be the same. However, if you, come, if you see the formula for average standard error, there is a factor of square root of n in the denominator. Now, as the factor square root of n is in the denominator, it implies that if n becomes larger, the standard error will become smaller. In other words, this effectively means that the standard error reduces by a factor of square root of n as n becomes larger, where n is the sample size. Now, we have a typical situation where we are going to be sampling without replacement. Now, this is because I will, I will take, if I, if I consider all the bills to be my pop, in the population to be uh, placed in a bin and I put my hand in random and pick out a bill and examine it, I will, I'm not going to be putting the bill back into the bin for before I make my next selection. So it is a sampling without replacement. Now, since it's a sampling without replacement, according to statistics, we need to add a factor of correction to our estimate for standard error, which is square root of n minus n divided by square root of n by n minus 1. Now, if you see that given our population size is nearly 3 million and our sample size is 160, this correction factor is almost immaterial because it works out to nearly 1. If, if one notices carefully, this factor can never be more than 1 and, uh, and it should never be equal to 1 because if it is equal to 1, then I essentially have a sample size of 1, which is not really a sample uh, at all. Okay, so we can consider, so you see this is very safe to state from a proven formula over centuries that the standard error will, re, re, the error in my estimation will reduce as the sample size is increased. However, the probability that my estimation will be largely different does not depend on the sample size. To see more about this formula, let's move to slide number five. Now, if we put some figures into this formula and notice that the error factor, the average standard error is the maximum if the probability of success is equal to 0.5. If probability of success is equal to 0.5, that means probability of failure also is 0.5. And uh, <clears throat> This is the situation we have when we consider a fair coin, which is essentially two outcomes, head or tail, both of which being equally likely, and thus probability of success equal to probability of failure equals to 0.5. Now, if we consider a fair coin, then the chance that we will make an error in our estimation is nearly 4%, which is not a very large figure by any means. However, it's a significant figure. 
But when we are considering a fact like number of errors in a bill generated by a computer, it is highly unlikely that one in two bills will be wrong. So we take a little better figure, a biased coin, where we consider one in thousand bills are wrong, which also is a very highly unlikely event, considering that we are generating three million bills. The computer department would be set serious questions if they produce so many number of errors, for sure. However, for the sake of calculation ease, if we consider one in thousand bills to be wrong, we find that the error in the estimation what we can make by this consideration is about 0.25 percent, which seems like a fairly small figure. Taking that cal calculation and the formula, we move to slide 6 where we examine the central limit theorem, which is the central formula or theorem around which most of statistics revolves. Now, it very clearly says that if an event is repeated large number of times, then the distribution of probability is ultimately normal. Now, this is a very powerful thing uh, uh, in the sense that uh, if we consider a normal curve, then uh, if we and if we consider that it is uh, plotted on the standard uh, units, then zero is the center of gravity, or zero is the point of average, or zero is the point where this normal curve would balance. Each unit away from zero is a standard deviation. So if we move one unit on either side of zero, we have actually covered one standard deviation. Now, according to the properties of normal curve, the area covered under one standard deviation is about 68%. If we move further, according to the properties, if we have covered three standard deviations on either side of the point of average of zero, we have covered nearly 99% of the curve. If we imagine this curve to be the average salaries of people in any country, let's say America, that means to say that if we calculate the average salary, that almost 99% or slightly more than 99% of the people will have their average salary will have their salary within the range of three standard deviations from the mean salary of American citizen. There will be exceptions like Bill Gates or Larry Ellison who will not be within this three standard deviation. But do we program or do we create predictions for Bill Gates? We do not. It is impossible to read people's mind who are like Bill Gates. So we do not even try to think of doing so. However, it brings to an interesting point that I can very make safely make conclusions if I consider three standard deviations of error in my estimation from the average. So under this presumption, if we say that, as you saw in the slide number five, if the standard error is 0 0.25, then three standard deviations would be 0.75%. And in conclusion, if we consider one in thousand bills to be wrong, the sampling of 160 bills will produce 99.25% accurate conclusion. That brings to a different question now. Is 99.25% accuracy in estimation good enough? Well, let's see. In slide 7, we try to see the impact of increasing the sample size. Having done the calculations as previously, if we consider a sample size of 1000, and again considering that we consider 1 in 1000 bills to be wrong, then the chance that I will make an error in my estimation is 0.1%. In other words, this means that I can make an error of 0.3% considering three standard deviations from the mean if I consider a sample size of 1000 with the probability that 1 in 1000 bills is wrong. However, this is, this is a good uh, improvement in uh, quality of estimation 
because now we are 99.7 percent as compared to at 99.25 percent. However, this has cost. This will require 13 persons over two days to do this job, which was being done by two persons in two days. Now it's a question for the management whether it is worth increasing the accuracy by 0.45 percent through checking a higher, bigger sample or considering some other mechanisms. Having seen all about statistics, we come to a conclusion regarding what is practical management under this circumstance in slide number 8. What our practical sense tells us is that if we consider a sample size of 300 bills in a population of 3 million bills, then we have a decent chance of making a prediction which is about 99.9% .9 accurate or 39 reliability considering a liberal estimate of 1 in 10,000 bills to be wrong. If a company spends decent amount of money in getting a decent billing system and getting a decent workforce in operations, then expecting less than 1 in 10,000 bills to be wrong is practical. So under this circumstance, we have a chance that we still will have 3,000 bills inaccurate in every bill cycle. But this cannot be taken as an absolute as well because if we have a company where we have more than 1000 price plans or packages, then the chance that in a sample size of 200 or, two, uh, 200 or 300 that a, that, a, that a bill from a particular package will get picked up is very remote, it's not very high. So it will be more prudent if we keep tab in operations as to what are the packages which underwent change during the month. Because it is highly unlikely that the package which did not misbehave in the previous month and did not undergo any change in the previous month will produce an error. It's, it can happen, but it is not very likely. And so if we concentrate uh, on the packages where there have been changes, the chances of our unearthing problems is much higher in such a sample. However, we cannot devote the entire sample to such packages and should consider only about 25% so that the remaining sample is still among the random of the maximum. So this is a possible mechanism of reducing the inaccuracy in the estimation or reducing this number 3000 even further. Last but not the least, we come to slide 9 and we have noticed so far that by sampling a small set of bills, we have a decent chance of eliminating maximum amount of error. But there is also a huge fact that we are not ever saying that we are absolutely eliminating the possibility of error. The errors can still be there. And every company endeavors that it produces error-free bills in every bill cycle. This has commercial advantage also because if I am really in a position where I can produce error-free bills, I have not to spend any money on setting up a customer care center devoted towards solving billing related problems, which is expensive. However, we can try and reduce the impact of such inaccurate bills because inaccurate bills means money. It means I have to give some kind of a sop to the customer to appease him so that he doesn't get noisy about the inaccurate bill he was sent. And with all so many social medias available in today's market, the customers can get really, really, really noisy. So one mechanism is that we consider larger part of the sample from the higher value packages or rather a prudent quality assurance mechanism could be I test 20% of my enterprise to gain 80% confidence applying 80-20 rule. 
Now, how do I? So, so what I'm essentially meaning to say, since my sample size is not very large, uh, only only about 300 bills. If I consider that I sample among the bills of the high value packages, which uh, uh, typically account for 80% of my revenue, then the even if there is errors remaining in the remaining set of 80% uh, uh, bills, uh, the chance that they will have an impact on my bottom line is going to be minimized. So the mechanism is that if I find the average sale value of the different packages and the different transactions, like when I activate or when I convert from another package to this package, or when I make a replacement of a same on this package or anything, any such transaction, what is the average sale value? And multiply this average sale value by the customer base of this package. So it is possible that we have a low value package which costs uh, some 40 or 50 reals, uh, which is about 500 rupees in India, but has a huge customer base of about 3-4 millions. So the average value of this package is very high. In comparison, supposing I have a package which costs 2,000 reals but uh, has got a subscriber base of 100 people, well, this is also valuable but maybe, maybe not as valuable as the other package. However, in normal circumstance, both of these examples will become a candidate for analysis during the bill verification cycle. We may choose to ignore a package which costs about 40 reals or 50 reals or maybe 60 reals and has got a subscriber base of a few thousand. Uh, most probably this is not going to generate as much revenue as the other packages which we've been talking about. Now if we, if we order these packages in the descending order of their value as, comp as calculated from their average sale value and the average customer base, uh, then we, we continue picking up packages from the top of this list Till we hit a package in the list by which time the set we have picked up accounts for 80% of the revenue of the company. Now we, we should normally, if uh, Pareto is to be believed, we should have normally picked up 20% of our packages uh, which would have been generating 80% of the value of the company. Now if we pick up our sample from among these 20%, we are making a decent chance that of reducing the impact of the error. However, again, we are too emphatic on, on Pareto and apply 80-20 on this set of 20% packages also, where we take 80% of the sample from the 20% packages as determined above and 20% sample from the rest of the packages. So we are not ignoring any segment after all. Uh, and also, okay, we have, we have considered the changes as in the previous slide. Now, have, taking these measures, it is likely that uh, we will minimize the impact of billing errors uh, during any bill cycle. Well, all I can say is, give it a try. Statistically, this mechanism has a decent chance of a success. If you find success, please let me know. If you do not, also please let me know. It, it can only help both of us in finding more refined mechanisms of finding better estimate of eliminating errors in billing. Thank you very much.